Good morning. I'm Kim McCleary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all so very much for joining us. And welcome to our 2020 election series, which we could not have done without the generosity of our sponsors and help from many community partners. Specifically, I would like to highlight our sponsors, Andrew Tavacoli and Dan Schnur, who are also board members, Dick Mader and an International Circle member, Joel Mogi, a diplomat level member. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for your continued support of our organization and mission. And we hope all of you continue to enjoy this special series. Please stay tuned also toward the end of this program where we can share with you how you can continue to help us, support us to continue to, to provide you with this quality programming. We can't do it without you. For those of you who would like to submit questions, there's a panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions, and Jessica will be managing them during the Q&A portion of today's program. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's program that will focus on the key swing states of the 2020 election with Seema Mehta, political writer at the Los Angeles Times and political professor Dan Schnur as moderator. Dan and Seema, I'm so happy to welcome you both to today's program. I can't wait for this discussion. Well, thank you so much, Kim. And thanks so much, Seema, for joining us today. I can't even imagine how busy you must be 20 days before a presidential election. The fact that you can take an hour to talk with us about what you're seeing out on the campaign trail, very grateful for. So thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Anyway, as, as some of you may know, long before we started our online programming back in March, last year we began holding a monthly breakfast series on the presidential campaign in person. Remember when we used to get to do those kind of things face to face? Well, Seema was our very first guest for our very first program all the way back last November. And she gave us an extraordinary overview of the election. And Seema, I should give credit where credit's due. So for those of you who weren't there, I will tell you that my friend Seema Mehta, in last, last November, predicted that Joe Biden would be the Democratic nominee for president, predicted that Kamala Harris would be the vice presidential nominee, predicted that Amy Comey Barrett would be nominated to the Supreme Court in an unprecedented fall nomination, and she even predicted that Brad Pitt would play Dr. Anthony Fauci on Saturday Night Live. So Seema, very well done. We're going to see if you can match that. We're going to see if you can match that today. Absolutely. And uh, Dan is obviously lying, but I appreciate the kind words. Okay. And for those of you who were there last November for the breakfast, okay, maybe that's not exactly the way it happened, but she's still really smart. <laughs> so Seema, we're talking about swing states today and geographic targeting in the election. And it seems to me that it wasn't too long ago, it wasn't too many years ago, when in a presidential election at this point, the entire nation was focusing on Ohio and Florida, and that was about it. The rest of the states were pretty well decided. The number of swing states were really just very minuscule. Well, the electoral map seems to have exploded this year. Um, we have those key uh, upper Midwestern states that uh, won the election for Donald Trump four years ago, Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin. But now we have this whole range of Sunbelt states also, ranging from Arizona in the West uh, to Florida in the East that look very much more competitive than they did even four years ago. So before we get into the specific states, what's going on? Why all of a sudden has this map exploded the way that it has? Yeah, I think it's, you're absolutely right, as you all well are. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, when we first started talking about this campaign, we were really talking about Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, these blue states that President Trump won, that Hillary Clinton, in some cases, very narrowly lost. And we thought that the campaign would really Really, the, those would be the key areas, and they are. Those states are certainly important, but as you said, the map has exploded. I mean, you have uh, Democrats visiting Texas. Um, it's it's really it's been fascinating to watch. And you know, I know we're all sort of wary of the polls given what happened in 2016. But if you look at the polls, I mean, the former vice former vice president Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they have such a lead in some of these states that they are feeling comfortable enough, and they have enough money, most importantly, to go to states that they normally wouldn't go to, places like Georgia, places like you know, Texas. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think Democrats have always talked about some of these states someday becoming in play, Arizona, because of the demographic changes that were taking place, but because of President Trump's 
sing uniquely singular presidency. Um, I think Democrats are feeling that they have more opportunity in these states than they they been they expected to this early. <clears throat> and you know, I just got back from Arizona, which just started early voting, and we're seeing this across the country. The amount of intensity in early voting, particularly in some very democratic areas, I mean, it sort of speaks to a lot of enthusiasm in states that you know we just normally didn't you know put a, we didn't consider as top you know battleground states. Um, but I think you know if you look at where the candidates are traveling and where they're spending money. It's clear that the map is fundamentally different than it was four years ago. Okay, so let's do this. Rather than trying to take on the whole United States all at once, let's uh, let's let's go piece by piece. And then once I've had a chance to question you, as you may remember from our last in-person session, we'll leave uh, as much of the time as possible for questions from our audience members in between you and me. Hopefully, we can give them some some helpful guidance uh, for the last few weeks of this campaign. So let's let's start where you started, talking about those three upper Midwestern states that keyed Trump's victory four years ago, that at the beginning of this campaign and still are incredibly critical for both campaigns. So if we look at that ring of upper Midwestern states, um, how do they look right now, and what should we what should we be watching in the upper Midwest in the last weeks of the campaign? I mean, the polling in all three of those states. But Biden is doing better than Hillary Clinton is doing at this point. He's also campaigning a lot more there and has invested more there than Hillary Clinton did four years ago. And I think there's a combination of factors. Um, with four years ago, Hillary Clinton, the African American vote was not as enthusiastic in places like Detroit, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee. And then you had that coupled with suburban white women um, not either not voting for Hillary or voting for Trump, coupled with a lot of enthusiasm for Trump among working class white men and working class white women. Um, I was just out in where was I? Where was I? I was in Michigan. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I was thinking a story about it's been, it's been a busy couple of weeks. I was thinking a story about working class white women. And you know, four years ago, they supported President Trump by 27 points. It was enormous, huge, huge gap. And if you look at the polling in a lot of these states, in most of these states, he still ha he still wins more of them than Biden does, but it's the, the nap the gap is so much smaller. And so if Biden does, and this is effectively what say Gretchen Whitmer did two years ago in her gubernatorial race, if she can if, if Biden can shave the margins in the conservative areas, so even he doesn't have to win the conservative areas, but if he just doesn't lose quite as badly in the conservative areas, while in, you know generating enthusiasm among minority voters, particularly in the cities and suburban uh, college-educated women who you know turned out for Democrats in droves in the midterms, then he's gonna I mean, he, he's gonna have a much better chance of winning these states. And I think we also the one thing that's been really striking to me in interviews in these states as well as um, places like Iowa. I, I knew that the Clintons had a lot of baggage, but in talking to voters, particularly talking to women voters. I did not realize how deep the baggage was. And it, you know, it could be, it, in some cases, it resulted in them voting for Trump. In other cases, it just resulted in them sitting out the election. And I mean, the Republicans obviously have their criticisms of Biden, but the, you don't hear the same antagonism towards Joe Biden that you did towards Hillary Clinton. And I think that that is like a key factor in this election also. Let's, let, let, let's, pick, let's pick up on that point. Um, the differences between Clinton and Biden, fair or unfair, in the minds of the voters. Um, the public opinion polling shows that while, Bi but while Biden's favorable ratings are not immensely strong, they're roughly even. About as many Americans view him favorably as unfavorably. Whereas with Clinton, they're very, very decidedly unfavorable, as, as in fact they are, they are with Trump. And it seems like Trump and the Trump campaign have been struggling to find a line of criticism, a line of attack against Biden that will be as impactful with these voters as the way they went after Clinton four years ago. Is that something you're seeing in, in that part of the country, just that the criticisms aren't sticking? Right. I mean, you know, we've seen the Trump campaign sort of cycle through a number of different arguments. Uh, at one point during the civil unrest, it was that you know people are going to come into your suburbs and make you unsafe, and you're going to call the cops, and they're not there. Um, at another point, it was basically saying that Joe Biden's a puppet for the most liberal parts of this party. And in talking to voters, I mean, if you talk to you know tr total Trump supporters, yes, they they 100% buy into these arguments. But in talking to undecided voters or independent voters, it just it doesn't quite stick as much. Um, particularly, I mean, we saw you know after he made the uh, suburban argument that it didn't change his poll numbers at all. When you try to paint Joe Biden as like a lefty sort of lunatic, like or communist, it doesn't. It doesn't quite play as well. I mean, you know, people have seen this guy, whatever you think of him, you might think he's doddering, you might think he's old, but he doesn't look like a crazy-eyed liberal. I mean, or you know, what, what the characterization um, or caricature of a crazy-eyed liberal is. So these arguments, I mean, they don't seem to be having as much 
uh, impact as the arguments that the President Trump made four years ago with Hillary Clinton when, you know, I mean, it's the, re the he, he was able to tap into this reservoir of uh, dislike, it's beyond dislike for her. And I'm, the, the the level of it just, I mean, I knew it existed, but the level of it really surprised me. I, I think some of it's misogynistic. I think some of it's, you know, she's been around for a long time, but Joe Biden's been along for, for, around for a long time and he doesn't, he just doesn't quite create the same antipathy that she did four years ago. Well, and we saw this to a large degree in real time, even during what I will optimistically call the first presidential debate. Um, I saw one reporter, and I don't remember who it was, I know it wasn't you, um, because I remember your stuff, is a reporter categorized or assessed Trump's approach in the first debate is his greatest hits. Mm -hmm. Sleepy Joe Biden, captive as the left, doesn't know where he is. Hunter Biden's problems in Ukraine and China, and one after another they came, and you could see Trump trying to figure out what the magic key would be to take down Biden the same way the crooked Hillary and the emails had been so effective from four years ago. Um, at this stage, um, not that I'm asking you to run either campaign for them, do you see any of the lines of criticism that the Trump campaign has tried out against Biden to be potentially more effective than others? I mean, just in talking to voters, I haven't. And um, I think you're exactly right. The first debate, I'd also would point out that the Trump campaign almost set expectations so low for Joe Biden that if he could like make it through the hour and a half without like, you know, falling on his face, like he would exceed them. And it was sort of, a, it was that, that was a puzzling strategy for me because I think, you know, I was, I was sort of surprised they didn't argue you know, this man's been in you know, the public eye for almost half a century. He's done dozens of debates against some of you know, some incredibly good debaters. Um, but instead, they just really, they set the bar so low. Um, so that, that kind of surprised me. Um, you know, but when you talk to his supporters, you know, his supporters do, you know, like I was talking to a woman um, at a, I think it was a Dollar General in Pawpaw, Michigan, and she totally brought up the idea that, you know, that Biden is too old and that he's not, you know, president and you know, that he stumbles over his words, but she does stumble over his words, you know, as do most of us, but, um, you know, so he, among his supporters, I do think, you know, that they pay attention, but among the people that he's trying to persuade, you don't hear them bringing up these points. Well, which speaks to a broader Trump strategy. It appears to an even greater degree than four years ago, he's not really attempting to reach undecided, the, what, what remains of the undecided voters. But in fact, they seem to believe, particularly in these three states, that there were enough registered white working class voters who did not turn out in 2016, that if they can increase the turnout among his base, that that will be sufficient to win. That's There's actually no totally a base strategy and uh, the belief that there are even more of these voters who, who didn't vote or don't, or don't regularly vote who he can turn out. And it's a risky strategy given, I mean, just if, if you turn on the news this morning and we look at the lines in places for voting across the country, you know, some people, the numbers we're seeing, I think when I checked last night, um, something like 9.8 million Americans had already voted either through the mail or in-person early voting. And early voting was just getting started. We have so many more states going online this week. Um, and it's, rec it's record-breaking numbers. I mean, it's you know almost five times as much as this point in time, you know, four years ago. Um, so, if, if the, you know, we won't know the, this election until election day, or maybe a little bit after election day. Um, but it, you know, it, we could be on track to see the greatest turnout since I think 1908. Like people are talking about 150 million Americans voting, which would be remarkable. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about early voting and about mail voting because the numbers of requested mail ballots around the country are off the charts, not just at unprecedented levels, but far beyond what these states have ever seen in the in the past. That said, as we've learned in studying past elections, a mail ballot is more likely to be rejected than an in-person ballot, because not because of fraud, but because someone makes an inadvertent mistake. They don't sign it. In Pennsylvania, they don't put it in that second envelope. In other words, unlike at the polls where there's someone to say, excuse me, ma'am, did you remember to sign your ballot? There's no one there. So if the if the rate of rejected ballots based on past years remains consistent, people who want to cast a ballot but did something wrong, how much of a challenge is that for Biden? I mean, that could be a challenge. It's it's there's a lot of sort of caveats. I don't know that we'll know until 
election day or after. Um, and I do think people are also really cognizant of this fact because, so I was just in Arizona, and if you want, Brenda, read about it on the front page of the LA Times today, um, there was a story about early voting. And I talked to Republicans, Democrats, and independents. And these are people who are doing in-person early voting. And they you know, had very different political views, but they had a common motivator, and that was fear. Fear that their ballot would not get counted. Fear that if they mailed it in, the post office would lose it. Fear that, you know, that somebody would destroy it or rip it up or, you know, toss it into some, you know, into a, a, a toss it in, uh, in the ground or in the trash can or whatever. Um, and some of those, you know, some of those fears are unbounded. Um, you know, there's very little evidence of actual fraud in terms of ballots. But there is, as you said, you know, if you don't, if you don't check the right box, if you don't sign it in the right place, I mean, there's a chance of your of your ballot not. Uh, being qualified or with the post office i mean you know we've all been reading about the troubles that the post office is having lately and you know so uh, the all these voters i talked to in arizona they all brought up the idea that this election is so important and they wanted to make sure their ballot counts and so for mail ballots i mean i do hear about people in the states you know now you, in certain places you can sort of track your ballot to make sure it gets there um that kind of thing and you see sort of you know online you know Democratic groups, I've seen less Republican groups, but just, you know, sort of civic groups talking about how to vote, how to vote, you know, how to make a plan to vote, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of emphasis on you know, trying to make sure people get it right. But I also think, you know, with this crush of like mail ballots, it's going to be in county registrars, they are, I mean, they, they are going to have their hands beyond full. Well, uh, just one quick uh, uh, moderator's prerogative here for our audience. And we, we do want to, we are going to go to your questions in just a few minutes. I do want to clarify the last question that I asked Seema. When I asked her if the influx of mail voting was a problem for the Biden campaign, that wasn't me taking sides one way or the other. Number one, there's statistical evidence that a much larger percentage of Biden supporters are voting by mail than Trump supporters, primarily because the president has been warning his supporters uh, that mail voting is, is not to be trusted, um, much to the consternation of his campaign staff that wants those votes. <laughs> Very I interesting know. message. Like I was looking at his Twitter feed the other day, um, as one does, and it was on Friday. And so first he tweeted out three or four articles about you know, problems with mail ballots. One was a problem where some ballots didn't have the right name on it. It was an error that, you know, that this, I think in Ohio that was getting fixed. Another one was like somebody allegedly threw out 19, 20 ballots in another state. Um, but he's, so he's tweeting out these stories about you know, bad things happening with mail ballots. And then a couple hours later, he's tweeting, today is the, you know, or, today is the first day you can get your mail ballot in X state. Go get your ballot. You know, mail it in or go in person. So he's his message has been very, it's been sort of conflicting or conflicted. And so of course the what what that's led to is as we were talking about a moment ago, is that a much larger percentage of Biden supporters are voting by mail and a much larger percent of Trump voters are voting in person. Now that has ramifications in on election night, because in many states those mail ballots won't be counted uh, by the evening of November 3rd. Um, I want to come back, and we haven't even talked about the Sunbelt yet, Sun yet, Seema, but maybe you can spend a couple minutes walking through what we should be expecting on election night, or what our Secretary of State, Alex Padilla, is now referring to as election season. <laughs> well, yeah, we... This is something in California that we know, because you know it, when we have close races, I'm thinking back to the AG's race in 2010 between Kamala Harris and Steve Cooley, we didn't know the results of that race until almost Thanksgiving. So we know that it takes us a long, long time to count ballots because there's a lot of Californians. Um, but it's really, I mean, I think it depends. If it's a landslide, then I think we should know pretty quick. Even if we don't know the exact totals, we should know pretty quickly. But if it's close, I mean, it could be days or weeks or it could be like Florida in 2000. And um, I'm, I'm hoping I've booked a vacation, so I'm hoping it's not like Florida in 2000. Um, but, you know, it's just, I think it really depends on how close it is you know, in various states. And also there are legal battles going on across the country about when exactly people can start counting them. And the rules vary state by state. So it's really it's really complicated. And the thing I fear that is if it is close, that both sides will use it to argue fraud. And in some, you know, in some cases, it's not fraud. It's just it takes time to count ballots. And we're, we're sort of in great. And this happened with the Iowa caucuses. And it was very unfortunate where I mean, there was a lot of problems with the Iowa caucuses. But one of the problems was you know, all, the media in particular. We all wanted to have that headline at 10 o'clock to say, X person won. And because we couldn't, it was deemed a huge failure. It, it was, it had a number of flaws with the technology and other things. But we've set up this expectation, and I think this is, you know, the media has part of the responsibility of this. Uh, we've set this expectation that we're going to know at, you know, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock election night, and we just might not. And it might, and if we don't, it's not automatically because things went wrong. It's because people are taking the time to do things right. Well, and for those of you who've been attending our webinars on a regular basis, I know you've heard me say this before. But it's such an important point, and Seema just made it again, 
is how important it is not just for well-educated people like yourselves who tune into a conversation like this one, but to let your friends, your family members, your neighbors, your coworkers know that if there is not a definitive result on election night, that's not a reason for panic. It's not a matter for concern. It's the process working the way we want it to, albeit a bit more slowly. Yeah, in a modern era, in, an, uh, in, a, in a television internet era, we've gotten used to election results nationally on election night. And the more people who know that that may not be the case this year, and that's not something to get upset or angry or panicked about, the better off we all are. So Simi, I thought your story on Arizona was tremendous. One thing, thank you. Um, can I say one thing that's interesting about mail-in ballots, which is that historically, Republicans used to cast a lot of mail-in ballots and Democrats would vote on election day. And it's it's interesting to me how like the, the tables have completely flipped. Um, it wasn't something that I expected. I mean, I was talking to a former chairman of the California Republican Party who was reminding me like that they invested millions and millions of dollars to register Republicans in California to vote early by mail. So it's it's uh, I think politics is interesting to see how trends you know change. Oh man, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. But I do want to dig deeper on your uh, on your Arizona research and the the work that you did there. Here's a state that's been pretty reliably Republican for a long time. And while Christian Cinema won that Senate election there just two years ago, I don't think Arizona's voted for a Democrat for president in roughly a quarter of a century. Um, there seem to be two things going on there I took out of your story, and I'd be interested in you talking about which uh, or both you think are more impactful. One, there has been a demographic shift, a mm -hmm. tremendous increase in Arizona in particular in the number of Latino and Latina voters and registered voters. But it also seems that, I mean, Arizona, if you've ever been there, is really just, it's one big suburb. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go out of downtown Phoenix and it's just suburb after suburb after suburb. Um, and this is this has historically been a battleground that's leaned Republican. This year it seems to be leaning Democrat. Which of those two, like I said, or both, should we be paying more attention to in the closing weeks of the campaign and what's now become such a key swing state? I think it's both plus retirees. Um, so you have the growth of the Latino population, which Democrats have been talking about for a long time. I mean, in 2016, at one point, the Hillary Clinton campaign was paying more attention to Arizona than it was to Wisconsin, which was a very bad decision. But that was because they were feeling really confident about you know, flipping that state. Um, and then you also had some really um, some hardline immigration policies that I think uh, have changed the electorate there in a way that we saw in California with Prop 187 and some of the battles in the 90s. Um, and then you have you have a lot of college educated you know suburbs, which are that's these are the people who swung from 2016 to 2018 and who Democrats are relying on to swing in 2020. I mean, this is the reason that you know Democrats retook the House in 2018. So and then you also have a lot of retirees and you know seniors are typically totally Republican voters, but the president has lost the, their confidence in part because of his handling of the coronavirus crisis, which has you know most impacted senior citizens. Like they are seeing people, their friends and neighbors die. Um, we just saw a golf cart parade at the Villages in Florida, which is this enormous, sprawling retirement community, which is normally totally Republican. And just the other day, there was just you know so many you know of these of their residents just out voting for Biden and decorating their golf carts, and um, it was just something that you don't expect to see there. So I think you have all all three of these cases, um, you know, retirees, college-educated suburban voters, and Latinos. Well, I'm glad you raised the, the older voters because we, we've talked about that on other programs in the past, but it's such an important point. This is a voter block, voters age 60 and over, that haven't voted for a Democrat for president since Al Gore in the year 2000. And depending, and Trump won this age group by a very large margin four years ago. Now, depending on the poll, they're running it at least even. Um, and in many polls, Biden with a, a fairly a notable lead in that voter group. Seema, we don't have time to go through all the other states that I'd like to. We're not going to have a chance to go through North Carolina and Florida and Georgia and Georgia. all the so I'm sorry? Marcia is so interesting too. There's so many interesting stories so, happening. I'll ask, you, I'll ask you a broader question about this, yeah, about the Sun Belt, because we talked about those upper Midwestern states. Um, I, I read an analysis recently that suggested that if Biden is elected president, winning those upper Midwestern states, that that's just sort of a, a course correction mm -hmm. for all, you know, Clinton's campaign four years ago, voters' attitudes toward her. That's just Biden running a different and perhaps better campaign than Clinton did. But if some of these Sunbelt states start going Democrat, 
states that haven't done that in many years, states like North Carolina, uh, states, uh, states, states like Florida, states like Arizona, like Georgia, that would indicate something more broader and more, more sweeping than just, a, uh, than just a, a course correction, if you will, wouldn't it? I think there's two answers to that question. One is demographically, these states are changing in a way that that most people believe that eventually they will likely vote Democratic unless the Republican Party changes some of its policies. However, that said, I don't know that we can predict anything with this election because I think President Trump is a singularly unique candidate. And if, say, a traditional Republican, say a Jeb Bush or a Marco Rubio was battling with Joe Biden, I don't know that we'd be seeing these numbers. Well, so I, think, I think it's a very fair point. And just as Clinton, for many ways, in many ways, was a singular candidate four years right. ago, Trump is a unique one for the both good and the bad, regardless right. of what side you're on. And so let, let's do this. I would, I, I would I would go through this whole map with you, 50 states, one by one, Seema. But Jessica got really mad at me. So let's uh, let's bring her into this conversation. And once Jessica has joined us, then we'll be able to hear the questions that our audience members have. And Jessica, yes, I know there's no such phrase as more broader. Sorry about that. <laughs> No worries. Uh, Seema, great to have you back again uh, with our organization. I remember you were a fast talker when we did our breakfast, and so you're an even faster talker on here. So um, if we can have you slow down a little bit, just because our technology can't, keep quite, can't quite keep up. So uh, but thank you. Our first question, what is the impact of changes in the 65 plus vote on key swing states, and what is causing those changes? Well, I think part of it just discussed with the coronavirus, but I mean, I mean, if you think about it, you have grandparents that haven't seen their grandkids in six months. I mean, like these are like real impacts that people are seeing in their lives. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And then if you look at the Senate races, I mean, in Arizona, yeah, I think Mark Kelly's leading um, McSally by like almost 10 points, which is, I mean, uh, he's, I think people expected that race actually to be a little bit closer and we've seen so much money pour into it. So it's having down ticket effects as well. And I mean, it's, you see some of these Senate, uh, projections and polls that are coming out you know, in recent days. And, you know, if you had told me that a year ago, I would have thought it was, I wouldn't have believed you. I mean, it just, it's, it's, I mean, we'll see what happens a couple weeks from now, but it's, it's definitely, it appears to be headed in one direction. Thank you. Um, can you tell us what proportion of the electorate are immigrants? I do not have, I don't know that off the top of my head. That's okay. <laughs> All right. what, what, what I will add though, and, and Seema, this is worth talking about, is it appears that one of the unforeseen trends in this campaign is Trump, at least in some places, is doing better with voters from minority communities than he did in the 2016 campaign. And one of the things I've read is that a second or third generation uh, American, someone who did not come here themselves from another part of the world, but rather whose parents or grandparents did, might not be as disposed to vote along traditional ethnic and, ethnic and racial lines um, as, a, as a first generation immigrant may be, particularly in the state of Florida. This is uh, having a real impact, isn't it? Right. And I think um, if you look at people talk about Latino voters, but I mean, there's so many different kinds of Latino voters. It's like such, you know, they're not a monolith. So if you look at a Cuban American voter in Florida versus uh, a Colombia or, you know, or somebody who's from Puerto Rico who's obviously an American, but, um, you know, those are two, they have a different, different view sets and different life experiences that, you know, make older Cubans more likely to be Republicans while newer um, Puerto Ricans more likely to be Democrats. So um, we're seeing shifts there um, in terms of uh, in minority communities. And then also if you look at African-American voters, um, you know, President Trump, I mean, Joe Biden was part of the, you know, the Crime Act, Crime Bill Act of, uh, of the 90s, which, you know, caused a lot of people to go to prison uh, particularly black men, you know, for, for offenses that, for, you know, for drug offenses, that kind of thing, that people don't believe that people should, you know, spend being in prison for these days. And President Trump was, he did sign the First Step Act. And, you know, he's worked to get some, you know, people out of prison who had, you know, fairly long sentences. So, um, I mean, is he going to win the majority of black voters? Absolutely not. But can he, is he doing a little bit better? In some of the surveys, he is. And I think the crime bill issue is, is, a, is part of that. And it's worth noting that just yesterday, in fact, the Biden campaign released a series of five television and online advertisements directed specifically at African-American millennial men. So Seema's point is not only smart analysis, but it appears that the Biden campaign is paying attention to it also. 
And the, the Trump campaign, I mean, if you look at it, they talked about um, Joe Biden's position on the crime bill in ads that they released in Philadelphia, Detroit, and one other uh, one other city that has a large African-American population. So, I mean, they were clearly, you know, they're targeting these voters. Thank you. Um, as a follow-up to that, is Biden focusing enough on turning out Black, Latino, and urban white voters versus trying to appeal to swing voters? Um, I mean, it's hard to know because we don't know exactly, because we're not, this campaign is unlike any campaign We've, been, we've ever lived through because you're not seeing the door knocking really. You're not seeing the organizing, the in-person organizing. So there's a lot of virtual organizing going on, but I don't know how effective that is because you know we just we just have never seen this before. Um, I certainly think that they are deploying. You know, they're if you look at their events, their virtual events. Um, one of the interesting things about this campaign is you know it's, as all of our lives have changed because of coronavirus and Zoom and everything, the campaign has changed and it's given them the opportunity to you know they'll have an event with. Yo-Yo Ma, and then they'll have an event, like I just saw an email for an event with the cast of Hamilton or the cast of the West Wing. Um, so they're really able to do these sort of niche uh, events trying to attract people and also to raise money. Um, so I, I frankly don't, we, I don't think we will know the answer of how effective their organized organization was in urban communities until election day. But based on the polling, I mean, it, it, he's, he's doing better than Hillary Clinton was in those communities. Yeah, I, I would say this, and he might be interested in your opinion on it, it seems to me, Jessica, that in response to the to the question, <clears throat> the Biden campaign made a very large, broad, sweeping strategic decision early on. And that even though campaigning in the 21st century in both parties has become more and more about base motivation and less about persuading undecided voters, the Biden campaign decided very early on that focusing on that swing vote, particularly those white working class voters who did not who did not attend college was going to be their primary strategic consideration. And it seems like what they've decided is that for voters from minority communities and for young people, the motivator to turn them out would not be Biden, but would be Trump. And so when you do see uh, Biden making trips to Florida to heavily Latino communities, putting up the ads, as I was mentioning earlier, targeted toward African American voters, that might be a tacit admission that even if it's those swing voters, that if Biden wins, will win it for him, they have to pay some attention to the base and can't simply rely on Trump to turn out those voters for him. Does that sound reasonable, Seema? It does. And I mean, you know, in every voter, every single voter I talked to in Arizona um, last week and this weekend, every Democrat that I talked to, not one of them talked about wanting to vote for Biden because they were so for his policies. Every single one of them talked about wanting to vote against Trump. So, I mean, Trump is a motivating factor, well, at least with this group of early voters, Trump is definitely a motivating factor. Thank you. Um, so I know you're crossing the country right now, but one of the big stories in California yesterday was about these unauthorized ballot boxes that um, have been put out across the state. Um, Secretary of State Alex Padilla and Attorney General Becerra uh, issued a letter to the California GOP but their response is essentially that uh, this is legal ballot harvesting. I wonder if you could comment on on that, and uh, I guess just address that story in our in our state. I mean, the history of ballot harvesting is interesting. I mean, it, when Democrats first started using it heavily, Republicans argued that it was a form of fraud, and then, but then there was also a subset of Republicans that argued in the state and across the country that you know, no, we need to do this too. Like this is a good way of getting our votes, making sure our votes get you know to where they need to be. So the issue of ballot harvesting is, I think, it's an interesting one. This with these boxes, I just read the same articles you read, and I'm not a lawyer, and I've, I've read, I just read the the law and it was a little technical and over my head. So I, I know that's a lot smarter minds than me like weigh in on that. Um, but it's it's sort of an interesting debate and an area where I think Republicans are trying to move into a space that Democrats have been using, you know, to boost their vote and their numbers for years, for years. I'd add, I would add this, Jessica, just for those of you who have followed this story in the news, the controversy is really over two separate laws. So you have one law is, is Seema correctly, of course, mentioned, which is legislation that was passed here in California a few years back, which allows an individual to return a ballot on behalf of someone else, um, as long as that the voter designates that individual to return the ballot for them. So that's one law, and that's what the critics call ballot harvesting. On the other hand, uh, you have uh, in California and in other states, an increasing use for the purposes of early voting these so-called voting centers. And a county will have a official and secure 
box in which you can place a ballot knowing that it will be delivered to the uh, appropriate local and county authorities before the election to be counted. What the Republican Party is arguing is they've essentially taken both of these laws and said, if I can return a ballot for someone else, and if people can put a ballot in a secure box and have it counted for them, then why can't I have a box in which many people can put their ballots that I'll return? Um, my own opinion, and as you guys know, I used to be a Republican, but I've been independent for about 10 years now, so this is a, the best nonpartisan analysis I have, is the law isn't entirely clear on this. And Padilla and Becerra have interpreted it in a very, very strict way. Ultimately, it's something that will be decided by the courts. But as near as I can tell, what the Republicans are doing is not something that isn't specifically prohibited by both of these laws, but rather than something that simply isn't specifically addressed. Thank you. Um, are you at all concerned about a Bradley effect type polling error that underestimates Trump's support? I mean, I think we all saw 2016. So um, there's a lot of questions about polling in the aftermath of 2016. And I think, um, I don't know if it's the Bradley effect or if it is, there's, we also call them shy Trump voters, people who are not willing to, you know, give their voting for Trump. But there's also on the flip side of that, People wonder if, if there are wives of men who are voting for Trump who might be voting for Biden, but don't want to say that publicly also. So um, I think that you know there's always some questions about that, but I think everyone's just hoping that, that the, I mean, not, not that the result of the polls are accurate, but that we are, can be confident in polling um, as a science, because it's important you know, in terms of what we do. And I think 2016 made people ask a lot of questions about how we do polls, especially in the modern era with more people using cell phones and um, people actually being less willing to talk to people and um, you know, pick up a phone from a number you don't recognize, that kind of thing. Thank you. Um, what impact has the absence of major third party candidates had on the 2020 presidential election? Um, well, I mean, we really, there are some third party candidates, but they clearly haven't gotten as much attention as they did you know, four years ago. and. I mean, it, honestly, it could have cut both ways. I mean, in certain states, you know, Jill Stein really uh, hurt Hillary Clinton's turnout. But I mean, if you if you had a particularly strong, like a Ross Perot type candidate, um, you know, that obviously that boosted Clinton back in the day and hurt um, George H. W. Bush. So um, I, once again, I think it's one of those things that's like it, there's a lot of hypotheticals there. It would depend on you know, what type of third party candidate what it was. Is it somebody who has a lot of money who could get their name out there? Um, is it somebody who is super liberal or is it super conservative? So um, I don't think we, we know what impact it would have had without knowing, you know, who the can who the candidate would have been and you know, how strong a campaign they could have run. Thank you. Um, kind of just a follow up to um, your discussions with voters about Hillary Clinton. Does that mean that every powerful woman will have an unfavorable likability rating? I don't think so. I mean, I think I mean I do think there's some sexism there, but I also think, you know, she. she she had a lot of baggage you know, just from her time in the public eye. And I don't think that other women, you know, when I, when I was I was following Kamala Harris when she ran for president, Amy Klobuchar, um, they did not have the, uh, they, well, they also weren't as well known as Hillary Clinton, obviously, but they did not invoke the same ire. And I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's fair, I'm not saying it's unfair, um, but there's something about her that, that aroused passions in people in a way that not as uh, that many other candidates don't do. Thank you. Um, if it is a landslide, and I, I guess this would be a landslide for Biden, would Trump say the results are false because the gap uh, is too big to be real? The president has clearly laid the groundwork for questioning the results of the election. Thank you. Um, how effective will voter suppression be? Um, I don't think we know. I mean, but the one thing we know right now is we're seeing incredibly long lines at uh, early voting places. We had people in Georgia wait in line for 11 hours to vote. Um, some would argue that that's like just completely, I mean, I think most people would argue that's completely unreasonable. Um, you have places in Texas where, you know, if you want to drop off your ballot early, you have to drive because there's only one drop off box in the entire county. Some oh, people, wow. that's the form of voter suppression. So um, the question is, you also have people who are fighting it, you know, who are trying to you know, I think there's somebody in Texas like offering free rides or free Ubers or something to let you drop your ballot off if you don't have a car or whatever. Um, 
So, I mean, I don't think we know yet what the impact will be, but I think that's also something that we'll be studying after election day. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Georgia and you did pique my interest earlier when you were uh, talking to Dan about that. So you said that Georgia is a really interesting case. Can you talk about that a little bit? I just think it's, you know, it's a state we think of as a totally Southern state. And then you, know, you had Stacey Abrams get pretty close to winning the, you know, the governor's seat um, a little while ago. And then just seeing these polls out of there yesterday, I mean, seeing these lines out of there yesterday was one of the things that just you know, totally piqued my interest because, you know, Georgia has, Atlanta has a lot of suburbs that kind of remind me of Orange County in that they're affluent, they, they you know, traditionally they were pretty conservative, but they're affluent, they're college educated, and they're, the, I think, like, Gwinnett County, I think, is one of them, like, they're the counties that could swing in the way that Orange County swung, um, so I just think it's just going to be a state that's, it's always interesting when states flip, you know, either red to blue or blue to red, just to see what's happening in them, and I think Georgia is a sort of a, a state we didn't expect to see flip that could. Thank you so much. Um, the stock market is almost back to where it was before COVID and looks like we are close to a cure slash vaccine. Is that enough to get Trump reelected? Um, in terms of the economy, I think you know, among four, and this also goes back to the story I did out of Michigan, uh, working class uh, women, um, they don't have 401ks. They don't have stock investments. Like they know what's going on on Main Street, not on Wall Street. They're the ones that are you know, sitting at the kitchen table, writing their bills, you know, and seeing what they can afford. Um, so I don't know that the stock market is going to matters to these with those voters as much. Um, and I think a COVID vaccine. I, I mean, I, I'd be sort of surprised if there's the ability, if, even if we had a vaccine, to produce it in large numbers before election day to make a difference. That doesn't make sense to me. And I think that people are so skeptical of the vaccine that, um, just based on polling, I don't. I, I, I don't. It's hard to see that that could happen in the next three weeks. Thank you. Um, Seema, any reporting yet by you or colleagues that Secretary of States are having to contact large or significant number of voters because their mailed ballots have problems? In Michigan, the county clerks are required to take affirmative action to contact the voter if they notice a problem that would prevent them from counting the ballot. I know it really varies a lot state by state. One of my colleagues, she's done a lot more research on this, but she was doing a story about, um, I think it was Washington. and. You know, like our signatures all change over time. Like if you look at my signature in high school versus my signature now, like it's unrecognizable. And so the woman who's the secretary of state there, her ballot got returned to her because her signature did not match it from when she first signed it. So I think I think some states are more proactive than others, but I don't know overall um, what the picture is. But okay, I think so, Arie, have a so you can, if you look at our at LATimes.com, you can find out a little bit more. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, and this might be a good uh, nod to Dan's program on Thursday, uh, where we're going to be discussing this more. But uh, what is your sense around the country about the importance of the Amy Barrett nomination in terms of people's concern and motivations to vote on either side? Is it a major factor now for many people? Or are other issues like the pandemic and recession just overwhelming the thinking of real people around the country? I heard, I mean, we, I heard a lot more about the pandemic and the recession, particularly because the pandemic is really, um, it's gone up the numbers, the cases have gone up in some of these states that we're talking about, Wisconsin, the fact that Iowa, we're talking about Iowa as a state that the president won by almost 10 points four years ago. The numbers there are huge. Um, so I didn't hear as much, but I do wonder, you know, in terms of conservative voters, four years ago, talking to evangelical voters, I specifically remember conversations in Wisconsin with a number of evangelical voters who were a little bit skeptical of Trump because of his behavior. They felt better once he named Mike Pence his VP because they trusted him as, you know, sort of like a moral leader. And but the, you know, the, the motivating factor that they kept bringing up was judges. And the president's been incredibly successful in nominating, what, more than 200 judges um, who are going to, it's going to define, you know, the, the courts for a generation or more. And now the Supreme Court. Um, so I think, I mean, if anything, if, if evangelical voters were at all, and we didn't really see much of them moving away from the president. But if they were at all, I think that you know this is an, another thing that would give a boost to the evangelical community to continue to support the president. Thank you. And yeah, we're gonna uh, on Dan's talk on Thursday, we're gonna dive in a bit more into the uh, the hearing that has been going on now. So um, we hope that those of you that are on today will join us for Dan's talk on Thursday. Um, Next question, is the surge of Democratic mail-in ballots in Florida significant in a state where Republicans typically win statewide elections by being excellent at mail-in voting expertise? I don't know. That's a very good question, and that's actually something we should explore. Um, I think Florida's, Florida's always been an interesting state, and Florida's also often been a problematic state um, in terms of counting ballots. 
Um, but it's, I also think demographically it's changing. You know, we were talking about, you know, traditionally whenever we talk about uh, Latino voters in Florida, we're talking about Cuban American voters. And now we're also talking about this influx of Puerto Ricans and how their vote might change, you know, sort of the dynamics of the state. So um, I don't know the specifics on the mail-in balloting, but I think everyone is paying a lot of attention to Florida um, as they do every year. But I mean, that's like, when you talk to, you know, the idea of, are we going to know on election night, people keep bringing up Florida as, you know, if, if things are clear in Florida, then things will be clear for pretty much the rest of the country. Thank you. And Dan might have some insight on this next one too, but uh, what were the root causes of reduced turnout in Milwaukee County during 2016 and have those factors changed since? Do you want to go first or do you want me to go? <laughs> oh, that's human. Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, African-American turnout was down in Milwaukee, Detroit, and Philadelphia. So there was a lack of motivation. Um, I think the Biden campaign has recognized that and has, you know, has really gone into these areas and tried to motivate people. And the question is, are, are they motivated? Um, you know, he obviously picked a, as his running mate, a woman who's um, who's half uh, Caribbean American, I'm sorry, African Caribbean, Caribbean American. Sorry. We always, I always get it wrong because we always, I always we want to when we write, we want to write African-American, but she's obviously her father, so Mr. Jamaican. But, um, and they've also got you know tons of surrogates out there, um, you know people popular um, in the cities and in these communities. So that's I think one of the main reasons that um, that Hillary Clinton didn't do as well in that county. But um, in the suburbs, also she didn't get as many of the sort of college-educated white women that she that if she had gotten that she would have been able to offset the difference. But you know these races were so tight that you know if, if Biden can just marginally do better in in a county like that. And sort of cut his losses in some of the more rural counties. I mean, he could he could win the, the state pretty easily. Thank you. Um, how will the press handle Trump tweeting that he won prior to the actual outcome? It's a quandary of how have we handled press the president tweeting throughout his administration. I mean, there's some debate about we cover the tweets too much. I don't agree with that because I think he's the leader of the free world, and his you know his words can move markets and start wars. So I think we have to cover it. Um, and obviously, he's been brilliant at using Twitter and social media to reach his supporters without a filter, without having to go through the media. Um, so, I think you know this what what we've learned you know, between 2016 and now, the things that we do differently. 2016, you know, if, if the president had a rally, cable news would just play it uncut for like an hour and a half. Now, when you see that, you'll see anchors um, cutting in on TV or reporters uh, online on, on our website or whatever, fact checking him as he speaks. Um, I think we've gotten better at saying, okay, the president said X, here is what we know, you know, to call out when he says something that's inaccurate, which I think, you know, I think people were at one point sort of uncomfortable with it because it was sort of, it was untraditional. It didn't go in the norms of how we've covered previous administrations and campaigns, but he also does not go along with the norms of how traditional camp presidents or administrations behave. So I think, you know, it required a course correction for the media to be willing to say, okay, here's what the president said, but this is not right. You know, this is not accurate because of X, Y, and Z. Thank you. Um, could you drill down into Maricopa County? Maricopa County is so interesting, and that's exactly where I was with the early voting. Um, and, you know, they had, you know, their sheriff, um, Joe Arpaio, was, you know, one of the most conservative sheriffs in the uh, in the country. When he, had, he was on 60 Minutes all the time, you're putting prisoners in, like, pink suits and the desert outside. Um, but it was interesting, one guy I interviewed yesterday, or Saturday, Friday, um, was a contractor, veteran, had voted Republican all of his life, almost all of his life, including for Joe Arpaio. And he's like, no, I'm totally voting for Joe Biden because I can't, you know, because he was, he was really, really felt that the president had um, insulted veterans. And so it, it was obviously, I mean, if Joe Arpaio was elected there so many times, I mean, it, it clearly was at one point very conservative, but it, I mean, there was a lot of Biden supporters that I talked to in that county. I mean, there's also a lot of Trump supporters I talked to in that county. So, and, then, and it's obviously the most populous county in Arizona. So it's going to be one to definitely watch to see which way that state is going. Thank you. Um, how do you see the fact that the military and veterans now support Biden ahead of Trump, 42 to 37 percent, and they source that from the military times? Um, I think it'll be interesting to see what the actual vote is. I mean, it's, I don't know what the sample size of that poll was, but I do think, you know, there's been a number of reports about the president saying, very insulting things about members of the military and people who have served. And also, you know, he once surrounded himself with, you know, what he called my generals. And his generals have largely left him and a number of them who I, you know, I never expected Jim Mattis to speak out one way or the other. And for to see somebody of that who has that much stature um, in the military, to see 
him speak out, I think that you know the the his words and um, other top leaders' words. I mean that they carry a lot of weight with a uh, sort of rank and file. Thank you so much. Um, are evangelical voters the biggest part of Trump's base? They're one of the one of the biggest. I think working class white men might be a little bit more, but they're both really up high up there. Thank you so much. Um, is Alaska in play for Joe Biden? I don't think Alaska is in play for Joe Biden, but there is a Senate race where there is an independent who's running against a Republican. Pardon me, because I'm not remembering their names. The independent is basically backed by Democrats, and in in surveys and polls, he's doing much better than a Democrat would traditionally do. So there's, I, I don't think it's in play for the presidential, but I think the Senate race is pretty interesting. Thank you. Um, has Cal Cunningham destroyed himself and the pro-democratic vote in North Carolina? It was. I mean, the polling that's come out since then is still pretty good for him. I mean, it's. I just don't understand. I mean, this is just a personal side. Like, if you're running for office and you know you're running for office, like, keep it in your pants. Like, you know, you know, people are gonna find stuff. You know, stuff leaks. Like, you know, aside from the morality of it, just like in terms of pragmatism, like, you know, this is like a, a totally self-inflicted wound. Um, yeah, and it's it's totally harmful. It is harmful for Democrats. I mean, he. It, it, I think the Senate race in North Carolina was the number one most expensive Senate race in the country right now because so many people felt confident in his ability to win and his chances there. And, you know, even if it's, you know, the polling still looks good for him, but there's still a couple of weeks, we don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, if it impacts him, it could also impact, you know, if there are other down ballot races that Democrats were hoping to ride in his coattails to, you know, if the Democratic vote falls off, it could, you know, harm their ability to win office. So we don't know what the impact is yet, but I mean, it's clearly not a good thing. Thank you. And just, just one final question. I'm going to turn it back over to Dan. Um, what about any foreign interference when you're crossing the country? Are you seeing uh, voters or, or campaign offices talking about that? You know, I think at the beginning of the election cycle, like a year ago, a year and a half ago, we were hearing so much about Russia and what are they going to do now? But this, I mean, I think coronavirus has just completely overtaken everything. Um, and I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense because it's like, you know, a once in a lifetime who could have imagined we would live through something like this? I mean, something that you read about in history books, but it's really, I mean, that is like the number one thing that we hear about. And it, you, know, you hear about it in different ways. You hear about it in terms of the economy, you hear about it in terms of actual health, you know, the, the impact on you know, people's social lives, the impact on people's work, um, how we work. Um, but that just, it's really overtaken everything. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Seema. Thank you. Dan, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Well, Seema, I'm going to ask you one last question. And this is one that, it's it's an unfair question because I don't think it's I don't think there's a a perfect answer for it. You mentioned the polls from 2016 a little bit earlier in the program. So as Biden's lead in the polls, both nationally and in the states, in the key swing states, uh, begins to appear that it's solidifying. Um, why shouldn't voters assume that these numbers are going to hold up. His margins are, are larger in many of these states than Clinton's were, but the tone of many of the questions and of much of the conversation, not just today, but over the last couple of weeks, has been that we're heading toward a, a pretty certain thing. Given the fact that you're such an experienced political journalist, would you tell us that that's premature, and if so, why? Um, I mean, I think we have to remember polls are a snapshot in time. So if we're looking at what voters said last week, that doesn't mean that that's, when it's, that's what they're going to say three weeks from now. Um, you know, once you see a certain number of polls that say the same thing over and over again, yes, it's more likely to go that way than not. But, you know, we also all saw what happened in 2016. Also, a lot of the polls that people talk about are national polls. I don't know why we do national polls, because that's not how we elect presidents. I mean, it's it, they're fun to write about, they're fun to report about, you know, you know, people can talk about them. But, you know, like California, we don't matter. It doesn't matter what we do. <laughs> you know, it's, we, you really need to look at the, the, the polling in the battleground states. And while Biden has a significant lead in a lot of those polls, um, it's not as great as its lead in the national polls. So um, I just think we have to you know, be cautious and remember what polls are. There, polls are no poll is perfect. And you know, what if there's a big storm in some super conservative area, or a big storm in some democratic area, and then people don't vote? Or I mean, it's there's so many things that could happen. Um, and also, we are still three weeks out. There's you know, policy-wise stuff could happen in either direction. Um, these are two. Both candidates are quite old and you know so health wise something could happen. I mean there's just I think there's a lot of uncertainty. So um for your know, candidates or supporters of President Trump or President or Vice President Biden, I mean I think the only thing that anybody can do that has any certainty is vote. Yeah, I I, th I think that's right. So it's one thing to say that Biden appears to be dealing from a position of strength. 
which is which is difficult to dispute, but it's an entirely different thing to say. Well, therefore, this this race is over. So I appreciate you drawing that distinction. You talked about how it takes something seminal in the closing weeks of a campaign in order to change the dynamic, though. Um, often people look to the presidential debates for mm -hmm. those moments, those types of changes. Second unfair question for you. How many more presidential debates do you think we're going to see this year? Zero, one, one or two? I think one. Okay. So it's 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 clear that uh, the debate scheduled for this Thursday night is off, and it looks now like Trump and Biden have both scheduled individual town hall meetings that may run opposite each other uh, on two different networks. So your thought is is that next week's debate will be the uh, will be the one and only or remaining one. So, but I mean, who knows what? Also, who knows what kind of happens between now and this week and next week? I mean, you know, as I said, you know, so much has happened this year that nobody could have predicted. But yeah, I think I mean, next week's if we're gonna have another one, next week's is gonna be the one. And if there is something in particular, either in that debate or elsewhere on the campaign trail over the next few weeks, that we should be paying particular attention to, what should we be watching? What should we? What, what are you going to be watching most closely over the next few weeks? We're seeing the president back out on the campaign trail after, you know, after he had to take a, a little leap from the campaign trail. I'm interested to watch his message, which yeah, it seems pretty consistent with his message beforehand, which is you know a very base-driven message. Um, with Joe Biden, he seems his campaign seems to be feeling confident, and they're pretty much laying low and you know letting the president sort of be the center of attention. Um, and I think if you know if they were to change course on that, I think that would be something unusual and something to watch. Um, but this. And also with the debate, I mean, the first debate was, you know, it was sort of at times difficult to watch. So I wonder if voters who might have watched, you know, part of the first debate, if they're going to tune into that last debate, because at that point, you know, you're so close to election day that your mind is likely made up. Do you want to listen to two people yell at each other, one perhaps more than the other, um, for an hour and a half? Is that how you want to spend your evening? I don't know. So, I mean, I think it'll also be interesting to see what the ratings are for that debate. Okay. And going all the way back to where we started this conversation, on the key swing states, on election night, and no fair saying all of them, no fair naming all 10 off, um, are there a couple of swing states in particular that you'd encourage us to be paying attention to as the results come in on November 3rd? I mean, every, every expert I talked to has said Florida. Like, if Florida goes decisively one way, it's going to be a very early night. Um, so, and then the the trio, a bit, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, they also sort of have an advantage because they're on the East Coast. So we'll know, you know, they'll close earlier. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, if, if Joe Biden is, takes back, if President Trump hangs on to those three states, um, it's, I think it's going to be a very late night. You know, there's, you know, we're going to have to look state by state, you know, until we get to the West Coast. Um, but if uh, the former vice president manages to get those states, then, then that signals a definite shift among you know, working class voters that I think we could see repeated in other states across the country. And so if, and we'll pretend for a moment that it's a non-COVID environment and you could be traveling around the country as freely as you would in, in most elections, if you could be anywhere on election day, hmm. to watch voters, to talk to voters, where, where, where would you be? Um, probably Michigan or Wisconsin, <laughs> which probably Michigan. Um, because of the large number of working class voters, because of the manufacturing issues there, uh, because you have city, you have rural, um, you have places that are quite conservative, and then you have these these bright blue, you know, Democratic spots. Um, I think it's just a interesting corollary to the country. But also, I mean, I, I love all the states. I mean, I could like I'd like to be in Florida, I'd like to be in Wisconsin, I'd like to be in Ohio, I'd like to be in Iowa. So <laughs> it's a hard hard choice. Okay. And, and, and I, I think, to, to, for the record, the question was intended, not where would you enjoy being the most, but what would be the most important thing to be watching? So I'm sure that Ohio and Florida and Arizona would not take offense that you mm -hmm. picked that you picked other states. God. Um, Kim, we're running right up against the hour, so why don't I hand it back to you? I think all of us could continue to listen to this for ongoing indefinitely. Seema and Dan, thank you so much for a very informative discussion. Seema, I think you nailed it when you said this is a campaign unlike any that we've ever seen. So having your guidance really helps us through this process with your great moderation, Dan. Um, for those of you who enjoyed today's program, uh, please type the word election to the uh, text, the word election to the number on the screen. 
Uh, we can't do this without your support. So if you want this great programming, fair, you know, nonpartisan, help us out with some contribution. And we have some terrific uh, programs that upcoming as part of this 2020 election series that Dan is going to continue to help us with moderating. Ron Brownstein on October 20th, who will be dis uh, discussing who will be deciding the, the presidential election on the 27th, how media will in influence the election. And Dan will be, a, be with us on a very special uh, for a very special program. So go to our website at lawac.org and register for those programs today. And of course, as Jessica said, this Thursday, more discussion with politics in the time of coronavirus with Dan. Thank you both so very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Everybody stay safe, stay informed. And tomorrow we've got another program on the future of US policy in Iran. So there's so much for you to listen to. Hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you.